so you might say circa 2017, 2018, when we started this and we talked about the basic programs and so on. So I'm kind of reaching back to the good old days on some of those topics. Uh, and yeah, we all do. Yeah, I'm afflicting right now. Uh, anyway, uh, we'll talk about alignment to WIOA 2. That was another big talking point we made a really big deal about when we were still in the ABG days. We haven't talked about that nearly as much the last couple of years. So we'll kind of turn back the clock and talk about that as another basics concept. We obviously are constantly talking about outcomes and services, but this one we'll go back and look at the six areas and kind of get back a little bit less into the gory details and a little bit more into laundry lists. Although of course we can't resist a few gory details. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit about services as well. Again, kind of from a laundry list perspective there as well. A little bit on distance learning. We did some trainings in June, July. We started talking about ways that you could apply outcomes from distance learning. All of the things we're experiencing. How can we still show that our programs are doing great things and our students are doing great things, even though we may not be able to get going on all the testing we want to do. And then a little bit of Q&A and a little bit of resources type stuff as well. Uh, the, the other, what I wanted to talk a little bit about is we really did update that data dictionary. A lot of requests that have been kind of hanging for a few years and never quite addressed. Finally addressed this year now that we're in quarantine mode. And, and uh, I don't think we'll take as long as we need, so we'll have some time for Q&A. So here's a peat and repeat slide that we've all seen many times. Here, I'll blow it up here. Here's a peat and repeat slide that we've all seen many times. The OTAN COVID-19 website. Uh, we've talked a lot about how this has been the hub of the COVID-19 adult dead universe since March 13th. Here's that COVID-19 page. Here's some FAQs, some from OTAN, some from CASAS, some from CDE and so on. Lots of information It's still you know, holds pretty strongly, I've got to say, even here six, six months later. A little bit of an update on the Octa memo is, you know, nothing new since the end of May, uh, but I still kind of feel like uh, there hasn't been a, much in the way of updates at the state or federal level lately. We had all kinds of information there in the spring. That one that came out in the uh, end of May, Octa, Octa memo 20-5, still the most recent one and still kind of holds true as kind of the best guidance we have for now, in my opinion. But that Octa Memo 20-5, I'll move along, is the one that talks about how you can self-report into the federal level. Since 2009, the policy's been you have to have that qualifying pretest. So for now, anyway, they're waiving that requirement they're going out of their way to still require a pretest and a post-test to get the measurable skill gain. But for the student to simply qualify for federal reporting, you can go ahead and self-report, you know, so that's the best, you know, kind of overview of what the requirements are for WIOA 2 and K for now, that it's understood, that testing is still required. It's understood that you're gonna have a really hard time with it. You know, getting everybody in before placing them is ridiculously unrealistic for most of you. Uh, so you can get everybody through if you're having trouble preparing the instruction or initiating the instruction and it's all held up because of testing. The feds have gone way out of their way to say, don't hold it up, go ahead and move forward with what you can do informally and, you know, placing them into the right level. I think that's a, the, oh, the other one I wanted to mention is that force majeure. That's just because everybody asks about it. It's more of a WIOA question than on the CAPE side, but because we had that force majeure or unable to test or unable to perform last year, a lot of people are feeling like it still exists this year. To the best of my knowledge, force majeure is so 1920, there's nothing in the federal regs or at the state level right now that's calling for any sort of force majeure for the 2021 year. That's not to say it's not possible. You know, if it happens, I really think it will happen way later in the program year. I wouldn't expect to see it anytime soon. But in any case, when you hear about force majeure and marking off people that can't test, that was the policy for 1920, but it's not the policy for 2021. 
there are some of you saying you want to market in TE. If so, that's fine, but just know that's not the policy this year and it won't have any impact on your CAPE tables or your NRS tables or anything like that. Okay, so getting into the meat of the presentation, we're starting with the CAPE program structure. So here's kind of what I mean, talking about some of the things, dusting off some of those things we talked about a lot three or four years ago. So we started those ABG accountability trainings in 2017. A big part of it was talking about that, what were then the seven ABG program areas. You can see them listed. They're the five we have now. It also included pre-apprenticeship pre and workforce re-entry. Uh, fast forward to the beginning of the 1920 year, a lot of the trainings we did a year ago on the last road show, one of the big changes we talked about last year was moving from seven program areas to five. So the short answer is we took out pre-apprenticeship and workforce re-entry. Workforce re-entry is now called workforce preparation. Pre-apprenticeship has the same name, but bottom line is what you see as number six and seven in the left-hand uh, list has been folded in to CTE, you know, on the right-hand list. More on that in a few slides, but this is just to kind of set it up. So, you know, here's a little bit more on that structure. The, this just summarizes the two areas I think that cause the most confusion with program structure. The top one is from an official statewide point of view, ABE and ASE are folded into one program area. They're not separate programs like we're used to in WIO, or arguably I'd say in WIO too, or you know, uh, California CDE structure, it's actually three programs. One you would call ABE, one you would call high school equivalency, a third one you would call high school diploma. For CAPE reporting purposes, that's all one program called ABE slash ASE. The other area that causes the most confusion is with CTE. That was the big change that we did a year ago where there's four areas of CTE. One is just obviously called CTE. Here's the other three. We've got short-term CTE, workforce preparation. That's the one previously known as re-entry. And then pre-apprenticeship, the definition for that really hasn't changed so much, but it's now been folded into CTE which is now a broader, larger program from a statewide point of view. So here's just another way of looking at it where we have the five program areas. We have what, the, what we consider the three primary areas of ABE, ESL, and CTE. You can see that up there at the top. And then adults with disabilities and parents supporting K-12 success remain official programs. So that's again, why we say we have one, two, three, four, five K program areas, uh, you know, right now. So here's another way of looking at the same information, detailing the three primary programs. Again, I'm saying the same thing in many different ways. Hopefully everybody's figuring that out. We've got ABE, ASE, ESL, and again, Career Tech Ed. Again, ABE and ASE from a K three point of view one uniform program that includes basic skills reading and math, HSE, which is GD and high set, and high school diploma. ESL, not really a whole lot to say about that other than ESL is obviously a big program and one of our primary areas. And then CTE, again, that's where the changes kick in. We've got CTE, short-term CTE, pre-apprenticeship and workforce uh, preparation. I tried to put together a little table, but I couldn't really do so without making it overwhelmingly uh, confusing. So I'll just stick with bullets here. So again, the beginning of the 1920 year, pre-apprenticeship and workforce preparation were moved under the CTE umbrella. Workforce re-entry became workforce preparation. Uh, I'm going to dig into this one before in order to dig into the weeds. So workforce preparation provides short-term workforce skills to populations with barriers to economic success. So you remember at the beginning of ABG, we called this workforce re-entry. 
I would say it had the term workforce reentry because it was kind of a tip of the hat to what we used to call older adults programs before AB, ABG, when we were still called AB 86, there was a big push to include older adults in the AB, what was then the AB 86 structure. There was a lot of discussion at the legislature for how to do this. I kind of think what happened is the legislature came up with a compromise where it didn't really include older adults, but it did add what it called re workforce reentry, that is short-term workforce programs for adults 55 years of age. So the compromise, I would say, is the legislature said, okay, okay, we hear you. We really need to have something that serves our older adults but we don't want to make it like the old program. We want to give it a workforce preparation spin. So we're going to call it workforce reentry. Uh, last year, you know, what happened is we changed it and called it workforce preparation, mostly in response to popular demand. What happened the first few years of workforce reentry is a lot of consortia said, we really love this program. We love having short-term workforce services but we don't necessarily uh, restrict it to those 55 years or older. We don't necessarily restrict it to specific barriers to employment either. So a year ago, we changed it from workforce reentry to workforce preparation, same workforce, uh, same general workforce preparation skills. That is, it's not occupation specific. It focuses on skills for any occupation, general workplace skills, like I said, and again, does not tie itself to any age range or barrier. It's now available for everybody. If you were one of those programs that really had something that catered to older adults or that catered to any specific barrier, that's still 125% A-OK, -okay, but it's no longer required that you do that. You can now offer those short-term workforce preparation services to any student, not just those in workforce preparation. And the other big question is, is there any real hours cut off? The short answer is no. There's no real hours cut off or line in the sand where if you're less than a certain number of hours, it's got to be workforce prep or more than a certain number of hours, it's got to be CTE but in general workforce prep is gonna be short-term in nature. Short-term CTE obviously is also gonna be short-term in nature, whereas regular CTE is gonna be long-term in nature. So that was a lot of babbling. Hopefully there was something in there that uh, everybody was able to understand. Uh, moving along, this is reiterating what I said, is workforce preparation providing short-term skills to uh, those with barriers or short, you know, economic success. Again, no age range, no barriers requirements. Again, it can focus on a specific learning population, but it can also be open to anyone. So I see a couple people kind of rogered out, so I'll move forward and talk a little bit about pre-apprenticeship. This is mostly the same definition we had in 2017, anecdotally, uh, not that many of you have gotten on board with this, but here's the definition. Again, an approved training and curriculum based on industry standards, approved by a registered apprenticeship partner. You know, that part in bold is what's really important, is you can't really have pre-apprenticeship without that pre-apprenticeship program having some sort of formal ties to an apprenticeship. Uh, overall, I really think that's been the big barrier. There's been a lot of consortia that have been interested in doing this, but a much smaller number of consortia that have actually gotten through all the steps and lived to tell the tale. A lot, a lot of different consortia have tried this but kind of given up because they could never quite get it off the ground. I'll just repeat that part in bold, a little oversimplified, but I really think What's uh, caused people to run the ground is you've got to get that articulation agreement with an existing regular apprenticeship program in order to have pre-apprenticeship. And then again, you know, it helps out if you can recruit it or uh, set it up in such a way that it, you know, uh, you know, that it promotes underrepresented or disadvantaged populations. 
I think the way to look at that second bullet is look at it the same way you would barriers to employment. So if you're using barriers to set up CTE or any of these CTE related programs, that might be a way to move forward because my understanding is they really are looking for apprenticeship and free apprenticeship that support those disadvantaged populations. The other thing I'll say unsolicited, I'm sorry, uh, what's my, I have a note, but I can't quite make it. Okay, sorry, is this a little bit better? I'm gonna wait for somebody to respond. Am I sounding better now than I was a minute ago? Okay, thank you. All right, I need to do, I need to put my uh, books under here. So hopefully that's still better. I'm raising it up so it's not bearing. Anyway, uh, the other unsolicited thing I'll say about this before moving on, even though nobody really wants me to, is uh, to me the key with these pre-apprenticeship programs is I'll just say 100% of the ones I'm familiar with that have gotten up and running and are successful are the ones that came up with some agreement with the union. The ones that approach the union and work closely with the local union seem to have lots of success with this. The ones that don't do that don't. I'm sure there's some that exist that maybe did it away outside of the union, but I'll say if there is one like that that exists, I don't know about it. Fully 100% of pre-apprenticeships I know about that are, say, that are boasting and saying they're doing a great job and it's working great for students, 100% of them work with the union to get it off the ground. And once they did that, it got a lot easier and now they have really good opportunities for their students. That's a little bit paid program announcement, but I really feel like uh, the data is overwhelming that that's kind of what you need to do for this. Okay, I probably should have moved this a little bit earlier, so sorry this is uh, a couple slides too late, but this is detailing CTE. This is that table that I just couldn't quite get right. But anyway, CTE is long-term and occupation-specific. Short-term CTE is obviously short-term and occupation-specific. Pre-apprenticeship like CTE is long-term and occupation-specific. Workforce prep is short-term and not occupation-specific. It's just looking at general workforce skills. I'm oversimplifying it, but there have been a lot of questions over the last year on those four areas of CTE. What's the difference? Why are we worried about keeping track of this? Again, it's just four different ways of accounting for it. So there's the short, you know, the short, uh, you know, cheat sheet for the differences across those four sub areas. Okay, I'll move on and get to the other programs. Another one of the, the five main programs is adults with disabilities. So again, we're marking adults with disabilities. To be clear, this is another thing we talked about a while ago, but not so much anymore. When we say adults with disabilities, we're referring to that specialized program specifically for adults with intellectual or dis developmental disabilities. If you have individuals with physical disabilities, hearing impairments, visual impairments, and so on, by all means, of course, you should be serving those students and marking special things in your data for those students, but those are not the individuals we're talking about when we're specifically referencing the Adults with Disabilities program. The Adults with Disabilities program is specifically for intellectual developmental disabilities. Uh, the, if you have those other disabilities, you would mark disabled under barriers to employment. There's also a bubble under special programs called special needs that's also applicable. But the bottom line is if they have a physical disability, again, visual impairment, hearing impairment, learning disability, those are, of course, very important issues, but that does not necessarily make one eligible for your Adults with Disabilities program. You should be serving those students, but serving them in the same programs as everybody else, that is, an ABE student that happens to have a visual impairment or an ESL student that happens to have a learning disability, et cetera. But those other types of disabilities should just be in the same programs alongside everybody else. So that historically has been the big trouble spot with adults with disabilities is distinguishing those disabilities that really qualify for the special program versus other, versus other programs that should just be marked as a disability. 
So uh, I'm, I uh, moved, set it up in such a way is it a little bit better now. I'm just boosting it up so it's not, uh, it's not uh, buried there. Can everybody hear me all right? Yes, Jay, that, that's better. All right, sorry. So Thank I you. see a question that looks more like for everybody else, not me. I'll just answer what I know is there are some that do the 18 to 22 is the minimum age for CAVE is 18. So theoretically, you could have some of those IEP folks. When we're talking about adult ed, we're really talking a lot more about IEP, IPP folks rather than IEP folks. That is people 23 and up, not 18 to 22. But the, there are programs that serve 18 to 22s. I don't know of anybody off the top of my head, but I do know a, a lot of people that do adults with disabilities. If you send me an email, I can probably dig in and find a few that are doing 18 to 22. Okay, so I'll move along here. So a little bit more on adults with disabilities. If you have that program, you can use the 2A to 5A. You can use the power performance-based assessment. That was a that really was a big bandwagon there a few years ago. A lot of you, you know, kind of dropped power 10 or 15 years ago and got back on when we had Kate. So uh, again, a lot of you are using it. I'll just say if you didn't know about this and you're interested, let me know. I don't know about the static. Sorry, I'm not sure what to do with it now. It's all propped up. It should be okay. Anyway, uh, so you can use power or the 2A to 5A. Uh, to measure individuals with intellectual disabilities. The short answer is those assessments are not approved for federal reporting, but they are approved in California for we owe it to payment points. So they're also approved as ways to measure these individuals for CAPE reporting as well. If you've got the other types of disabilities, that is those with uh, learning or physical disabilities, then our answer is you should use the same assessments as everybody else, but admittedly, you might want to use some of the approved testing accommodations, giving them more breaks, giving them more time to complete the assessment, and so on. But again, with most of those types of disabilities, you don't want to do anything that special. You just want to accommodate them so they're able to, you know, uh, go get through the same things all other students are able to get through. Okay, parents supporting K-12 success. I've got to say we're three or four years in, and this is still one that I've got to say is a little bit ambiguous. I kind of feel like uh, we've never quite gotten here yet, but I do know there are some that have gotten into this. Hopefully there'll be maybe a couple of those, uh, maybe a couple presentations in the K Summit addressing this or whatever because I admit I don't think at a state level we've really gotten that far with this program. Uh, so I'll just parrot that same basic definition where you're providing uh, education to adults. Typically parents or community members who are helping school aged children, you know, again, it doesn't really have a way to measure how we're supporting K-12. There's no hard requirements. You're not required to have a child in the K-12 system, for example. There's nothing like that that's really in writing that says you've got to do X, Y, or Z, but primarily that's what it's for. We do have that, that box to market. I think most are treating supporting K-12 student success a lot like you were uh, supporting the old parenting program. By policy, they're not exactly the same thing, but anecdotally, that's what I think most people are doing. But again, this is an area that we definitely still need to kind of make more progress on, but there's the definition for that. And yes, that remains one of the five basic eight programs. A little bit on barriers to employment. We'll be getting more into this one next week, and we'll really be digging more into some of the changes over the last year in the advanced session next week. But the one I wanted to bring up that I really see is more of a basics level issue is barriers to employment. We started doing barriers to employment when we started WIOA. It was a new category. That is students that have specific, I always call them card carrying issues that might impede the student to get a job and do many other different things. So CAPE adopted that just like WIOA. Last year we made it an official CAPE policy where you're required to mark barriers uh, for all students upon enrollment. Last year is also when we linked 
barriers to employment the same way the feds do, where by definition, everybody in uh, ABE and ASC is, uh, you know, is uh, literacy, improve literacy skills. Everybody in ESL is English language literacy skills. That's automatic when we report to the legislature and report to the feds. And then as we explained in detail when we talked about workforce preparation a few minutes ago, we're no longer tying this to anything related to uh, workforce prep or workforce reentry. Okay, I'm gonna pause. I feel like I've said it ridiculously big mouthful here. Everybody hanging in here, I see some discussion on the 18 to 23s. I don't see any specific questions. So let's do a sanity check here and make sure that everybody's hanging in and make sure also that this is more or less like uh, what everybody was expecting to get themselves into. I have to admit, I'm not 100% sure. Okay, well, that's enough. I'll take that as a yes, thank you. Okay, so here's another note, and this is another one that we'll probably dig into a little bit more next week. Uh, hang on, can I clip? Sorry, my thing's cut off. Uh, you know, I'll try, but the short answer, I see your question, Janie, it's a great question. I gotta say the short answer to your question is no, I can't, because there isn't really anything in writing that says, if it's this long, it's gotta be regular CTE. If it's this short, it's gotta be short term. What I'll say is this is very unofficial, but of course to answer, I say 48 hours of instruction, the 48 hours I get from the chancellor's office, the chancellor's office does have 48 hours as kind of an informal requirement for the colleges. It's literally the only resource I know that gives any number attached to that at all. So given that it's the only resource I can come up with that gives a number, that's the number I give. But does that mean you're wrong if you're counting something 50 hours of short-term CTE? Absolutely not. It's a very soft 48. But if you're just looking for guidance, 48 hours of instruction is what I know from the chancellor's office. It's at least something instead of not. Okay, one last concept that we'll get into more next week is on the uh, Kate program hours. Uh, I think here in a, in a week or so that's due. So that might be something a lot of people are talking about. When I did my network meetings at the end of August, it ended up as kind of a big discussion topic. So that key program hours report. Uh, so, so, to, so just to be clear, uh, if you've got individuals in more than one program, if you go back a year or so, uh, that was a big source of confusion. It was an issue in TE and it was an issue in basically every other attendance system and data management system, where if you had those individuals in more than one program, it would duplicate hours and you'd cross check and get a lot of funny data. So a year ago, the way we feel we fixed it is if you have a, a class that's integrated, that it, let's use IT because it's the best, easiest example. In IT, you mark a class that's uh, ESL and career tech ed, then TE by definition will mark it 50% ESL and 50% career tech ed. If you know that's not really the right answer, fine. You know, then you need to create two separate classes and just be careful to put all the CTE hours in the CTE class and all the ESL hours in the ESL class. That was a big issue last year. So I did want to bring that up as well. Okay, sorry, I need to click to move this, I guess. Okay, another big issue, and this has been an even bigger uh, question the last month or so is that service hours issue. So I'm gonna be a little bit of a quiz master and ask everybody to recollect that issue from a year ago when we talked about how we're not tracking service hours anymore. While you, while you answer, I'll keep talking and bring up in 1819, that was kind of the biggest question out there is whether or not to count those short-term services as hours of instruction. So in 1819, we were hemming and hawing and not giving any answer because we didn't have one. Then at the start of the 1920 year, we did have one, and this was the answer, that we're not tracking service hours. So I'm jumping up and down on this one because a lot of you have noted uh, 
in those Kate program hours reports that you've got a smaller number, usually the question is something like this, where you're looking at your hours for, I'm getting advanced here, sorry, but you're looking at your hours for 1920 and comparing it to 1819, and you're seeing a really big difference. And it's something like, well, I expected COVID to make a difference, but come on, give me a break. It shouldn't be that big of a difference here. And so uh, what I think a big difference is, especially for those of you who are importing hours from other data systems, uh, I think what's happening is you had an artificially high number in 1819 because all those service hours were getting in and populating that report. Again, in 1819, that was 100% A-OK -okay because there was no policy. But now a lot of those other data systems rightfully and dutifully reset it so they wouldn't uh, set for those service hours to get into to TE when you're doing that import-export. So if you're looking and you're seeing differences that seem larger than they ought to be, that might be the reason is that in 1819, we were including service hours in 1920, we're now not. So testing does, if you're doing pre and post testing, you can count that hour or two for pre and post testing as instructional hours. I'll just say that sounds like a convenient answer from the CASA guy, I admit, but the feds actually have gone out of their way to say the pre and post testing that students are doing as part of their state and federal reporting requirements does count. But again, the legal counseling and the fiscal counseling and all that that comprises most of the short term services does not. Okay, and here's the federal definition if you want proof in the pudding. And then here, just because we're in the area of federal regs, here's the official federal definition of distance education. This was a little bit from the uh, presentations we had in the summer. Well, again, just about everything but uh, pre and post. So if you're doing counseling, you know, you're doing fiscal counseling, legal counseling, uh, any kind of personal counseling, that's great that you're doing it, but it's not part of instructional hours. If you're doing things like CPR training, that's great that you're doing it, but it's not part of instructional hours. I'll go back to this definition in the federal guidelines is, uh, I think the way to look at it that makes it easier to figure it out is uh, instructional hours are not necessarily classroom hours as we're in the COVID area. We obviously know that's not what they're talking about. It's not related to the classroom, but it is related to that instructional program. So if you're an ESL student, your instructional hours are mostly going to be, uh, you know, from the ESL class in which that student is enrolled. If you're doing, uh, if you're, if you have things like pre and post testing, uh, you know, that does relate to that student's ABE program or ESL program. But uh, if you're doing other types of counseling, that's great, again, that you're doing it, but it doesn't directly relate to, you know, that program. Okay, so moving along here, sorry, skipping along. So here's another oldie but goodie. Uh, right, so if you're doing the testing, it's part of the, it's, you know, yeah, I think you're right there, Connie. So anyway, uh, another oldie but goodie is talking about how we aligned K to WIOA. Uh, here are those four WIOA title numbers. We talked about this ad nauseum, you know, back in 2016. We kind of gave you a little bit more when we started up with ABGK. So we're carefully aligning K to WIOA Title II. We're aligning it to Title II because that's the part of WIOA that pertains to us. That's the section that addresses adult ed and literacy. Title I addresses workforce programs. Title III addresses short-term workforce. Title IV, voc rehab, that's individuals with disabilities and individuals receiving workers' compensation. I don't want to dig into it too much, but I just use this as basic definitions because this is the basics level. Uh, this is the basics level uh, training. So again, a big part of what we need to do for CAPE and a big part of our requirements of the legislature is we're aligning this to WIOA. I kind of feel like in more recent years, uh, this has kind of gotten lost because we talked about it all the time early, but we haven't really talked about it in the last couple of years of trainings. But just as a reminder, 
you know, were required by the legislature to relate CAPE to the existing uh, federal structure, which I would say is we owe a, in particular for us, because we're all adult ed, we owe a title to. And so this is what we talked about a few years ago. Whoops, sorry about that. So now I missed. Okay, here we go. So this is what we talked about on how we aligned we owe uh, to our CAPE outcomes. So uh, the legislature came up with AB 104 and basically directed that all the outcomes that our adult or ed learners accomplish is, uh, you know, uh, you know, has to be across these six categories. We'll get more into those in a minute. They relate directly to what the feds call performance indicators and measurable skill gains. They have what they call six performance indicators. You know, employment and wages are two of those six. That's the, you know, the two quarters after exit and four quarters after exit sort of stuff. But a lot of it, you know, from WIOA. And then they have five specific measurable skill gains. So I just used this slide to show the legislature came up with those six areas of AB 104, not still coincidentally, Five of those six are directly been borrowed and stolen from what the feds already laid out for WIOA. They did add a six that doesn't really directly relate that issue with transition. Jay? Yes. The PowerPoint has gone away. Can you share your screen again? Okay. I don't know why that is, but okay. Hang on just a minute. Okay. Okay, is it better? Yes, thank you. All right, sorry, I don't know. I, don't, I have no idea why that happened. Anyway, uh, so here's a slide that just about everybody's seen a million times. Again, here are those six areas of, uh, of AB 104. Again, literacy gains, secondary, uh, post-secondary employment wages and transition. So we talked about this all the time there a few years ago. Those six areas, I think a lot of you have now committed it to memory, but we have those six broad categories as stipulated by the legislature. Then what we did back then in around 2017 is we looked at those state and federal outcomes in detail. We aligned all of our outcomes to CAPE to one of those six categories as stipulated by the legislature. Here's that graphic, it still basically holds true. We've made a few tweaks here over the years, but basically it's the same list of outcomes that we've had for four years now, filed into one of those six basic categories as stipulated by AB 104. So I'm gonna kind of go back old school here. Uh, in recent trainings, we've talked a lot about outcomes but we've just kind of hit on the high spots here. In this one, we're gonna kind of go back and smell the coffee with everyone, and we'll still hit the high spots too, but we'll make, a, make an effort to talk about all of them, not just the frequently asked questions. So the first one on the board is literacy gains. Uh, some people would say the title's a little bit, you know, uh, misleading, because they're not all literacy gains. But we use this title because it directly relates to that measurable skill gain concept that the feds outline in WIOA. So obviously the big thing with measurable skill gains are those gains that students earn from pre to post testing. That's the biggie in WIOA too. That's the one that comprises most of our gains in CAPE reporting also. But we also kind of uh, brought in, you know, some other things from the federal system. So one of them is that Carnegie units. That's gotten a lot more airplay here in the last six months. That's the one where you measure a student's gains using high school credits instead of testing. When WIOA started a few years ago, the feds formally allowed that as part of federal reporting. That's another area that the feds would call a measurable skill gain. It's actually reported in an RS table four just like pre and post testing. The third one is kind of CAPE only, it's for colleges, it's that CDCP certificate. There are formal programs where learners can earn a certificate. That was added at the beginning, as far as I know, that's not changed. Then the bottom two are related to career tech ed type programs 
or maybe not career tech ed, but I'll just say they relate to those four areas of career tech ed we talked about 10 or 15 minutes ago. One is called occupational skills gain. The other is called workforce preparation. Just so you can all make sense of this chart, because I've rattled off these outcomes without really addressing the chart, but the chart is what we've been using kind of to align how you might go about recording the outcomes, how they relate to your data collection. So just to be clear with pre and post testing, I think that's straightforward to everybody, but you're obviously just having students test in e-test. When they, the student completes the test, that automatically goes into your TE system. So obviously you're not marking anything in your data there. You're just having the student complete the test. Carnegie units, there's no bubble, but there is a way where you're marking that under self-reported level. And then these other areas here with the bullets for those other three gains, and this will be something we'll be showing in, other, in subsequent slides and other areas as well, is it just showing you what to mark? I'm not gonna talk about that a lot, because we've developed those slides that give it all on one slide, but just so you know what the heck those bullets refer to, the bullets refer to the specific checkbox or bubble in TE that you mark whenever a student happens to earn that particular outcome. That's that retrofitting we talked a lot about a few years ago, where again, 2016, 2017, we looked at all the outcomes we wanted to collect for Kate data reporting, and we retrofitted it to TE and to the entry and update record. We definitely did a way less than perfect job, but we made a lot of guesses on exactly how which CAPE outcomes related to which existing WIOA outcomes. And we've just sort of stuck with it because we have way too much documentation out there to really turn back now. Okay, here's that Carnegie units or high school credits. Here's the gory detail. So we use self-reported level. This is how you can document gains for students that make gains through credits rather than through pre and post testing. Primarily, these are gonna be for students who are in your high school diploma program. So in the federal regs, it says you get a measurable skills gain when through high school credits, the student starts the year at the ninth or 10th grade level and advances to the 11th or 12th grade level through Carnegie units or high school credits. So long story short is there's a way to mark credits in TE, but everybody has a different way of doing it in different districts. So using that is kind of a non-starter because all you districts have a different way of accounting for high school credits. So instead we use the self-reported level, you, as you can see from the screenshot on the slide, so what you're doing is you're marking ASE low upon student enrollment, and then sometime later in the year, you select ASE high whenever that student makes enough gain through credits to be at either the 11th or 12th grade level. So I'll bird walk a little bit just because the question always comes up. A common number I hear from a lot of you is 180. That is 180 is a pretty common number of credits that a district in California requires for a student to graduate. So if you require 180 credits to graduate, then I would say 90 is your magic number because that's just the halfway point. That is if they're below 90, they're at the ninth or 10th grade level. If they're above 90, they're at their 11th or 12th grade level. So if the student starts below 90 and ends up above 90, you can mark ASC low and then ASE high sometime later, that will get the student a high school credits measurable skill gain that counts as an outcome for Kate. As an aside, it also counts as an outcome for we owe a title to. So I'll stop on this when I went deeper in the weeds here than I probably should have, but everybody asked this question, so I just went into the weeds without being asked. It's a good, chance, good time for a sanity check anyway because I do feel like I've been talking in one continuous run-on sentence forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. So let me stop. Okay. Uh, it could be an HSE student, but in general, you're going to be looking at this from high school diploma because you're looking at credits. Okay, 
Here's another clarification one, moving on to those CTE-related literacy gains, occupational skills gain, and workforce prep outcome. This is literally the single, uh, this is the one CAPE-related talking point that I probably talked about more than any single CAPE talking point period over the last five years, because this is the one that I put in every CAPE presentation I ever do, because this is by far the single most frequently asked question in CAPE history. What's the difference between occupational skills gain and workforce prep milestone? They both relate to those CTE-related outcomes. They're both CAPE literacy gains that relate more to CTE folks than ABE or ESL folks. Occupational skills gain is the one we use when the student accomplishes a portion of a longer term program, workforce prep milestone is for full completion of a shorter term program. So for occupational skills gain, here's the example. We have a welding student that's in five modules long, we'll just say a five module slash five semester long program. Uh, the student is in, again, five semesters. They finish the first semester. They complete some sort of skills check or written test to show they're good to go. They finish the first semester. They're ready to move on and start the second module or second semester. So they're moving on to module two. That's an excellent example of an occupational skills gain. Again, that completion of a portion of a long-term program is the way it's always been at the beginning of last year is when we incorporated that skills check or written test in response to uh, changes at the federal level. So we now say there's nothing that's really gonna snoop up on you. You remember the joke about the Cape Data Police. There's literally no way I can see the Cape Data Police coming and getting you to really checking whether you actually did that skills check or actually did that written test that said, we went way out of our way a year ago to say you should do that skills check or written test before you mark an occupational skills gain. Workforce prep outcome, again, a shorter term program. So we'll just say the student enrolls in a 15 hour course on job search strategy. Hey, they earned some kind of documentation. The secretary printed a, set, a certificate out of her computer and the student was handed that when they finished. They're still alive after the 15 hours. That's when you can mark a workforce prep milestone. Okay, and then here's another way to denote the difference, taking it to the next level. So that occupational skills gain versus uh, workforce prep milestone is the number one most frequently asked question. I don't think this is number two, but it makes the top 10 somewhere way below that other question. But once you figure out whether it's an occupational skills gain or workforce prep milestone, how the heck do you distinguish that between what you might call a higher level outcome that rises to the level of post-secondary? So again, we're looking at post-secondary and literacy gain. When we're talking about a post-secondary outcome, here are those three outcomes we have in TE that we would call post-secondary outcomes and relate to CTE or workforce-related outcomes. And then we have the lower-level literacy gains. So again, you get those literacy gain outcomes either for partial completion of a longer-term program or for full completion of a shorter-term program. It rises up to the level of post-secondary when the student gets full completion of that longer term program. So working back to my top example here, if the student is just completing module one and ready to move to module two, that would be a literacy gain. That would be a measurable skill gain within that student's program. I'll just say, hey, a lot like what we're doing with pre and post testing, a lot like we might do with Carnegie units as well. That is, we're looking for ways to measure students while they're still in program that we talked a lot about that a few years ago, where, yeah, we know that we've got those tangible outcomes like get a job, earn a diploma, get the GED, and so on. But we know, especially in programs like ABE and ESL, 
a lot of the progress is while the student is still within program, a lot of that progress occurs before that student is ever ready to get a job or get a pay raise or get an occupational licensure or whatever. So that's why we have things like pre and post testing and high school credits is we wanna be able to measure student gains uh, what, you know, while they're still in program. So this is just something we came up with for CAPE reporting. So we have similar sorts of ways to measure progress for students while they're enrolled in those CTE related programs and gains they're making before they're ready to actually get a job or complete that license or certificate that certifies them to be a welder or an HVAC person or whatever in the state of California. Uh, ASE low or high? So Jackie, yes, for most students, you're talking to the CASAS guy, so of course I'm gonna say for the overwhelming majority of your students, you're gonna get student level placement by a CASAS pretest. But uh, back to the high school diploma issue, is you know that sometimes you'll have higher level students in HSE or high school diploma that might score really high. That is, they have a score that's really too high to get them to place into those federal levels. So you might, you know, an example would be, hey, they get a pretest of 258 or something like that. Obviously, they're not gonna get a pre-post gain because they're already scoring really, really high on their classes pretest. So you might want to consider using high school credits for that learner and see if you can get a gain that way instead of testing. So in that particular area, you might place them based on high school credits rather than the pretest. I'll just say overall, if you want to go ahead and pre-post those learners, that's totally A-OK. -okay. And of course, the primary way to get into the Fed tables is through the pretest, not through credits. You might say if you do anything and everything, that pretest score generally is going to override, you know, that uh, high school credits placement, you know, when we're looking at federal reporting and so on. Hopefully that answers your question, Jackie. Sorry, I think I answered it a little late. Okay, so hopefully these two questions are now answered. So we're gonna get back more basic here. So we did wanna take time and rattle off these lists. So high school diploma HSC, either they earn the diploma or they earn high school equivalency. Just to be clear, that's now two different high school equivalency exams in California, not three. The task is no longer in California. So you either pass the GD or pass the high school. Post-secondary, okay, this is uh, a slide that I showed earlier, but I didn't really talk about, so I will now, where for post-secondary, I should have had this right after that, that uh, post-secondary slide, I guess, note to self. But anyway, this is what we were talking about in the early days, again, when we were talking about that rising to the level of post-secondary concept. So I just explained it in terms of what's literacy gain or measurable skill gain versus what's post-secondary. So the short answer in that other slide is, is post-secondary is when they complete the whole thing. That is, they are, they're not advancing or maybe passing a significant milestone in their welding program. The post-secondary outcome is when they're 100% finished and get that final certificate that enables them to get that job as a welder or whatever. So these are just ways that you can measure whether it's really rising to the level of post-secondary and also whether it's an official certificated, certificated program that counts as post-secondary. So the short answer is it's on that eligible training provider list or ETPL. That's the one that the WIOA one in each local region has for the programs that uh, give that certification, you know, uh, workforce uh, certificate. Uh, you can also uh, be a CDCP program on the college side. That's where I get that 48 hours, by the way, to whoever asked that question. And then if, you, if the program qualifies for Perkins or it qualifies for COE reporting in Title IV, those are higher standards than what Title I has. So given that they're higher standards, not lower, it goes without saying that that's also fine as well. 
So I admit that this is another one of these issues that remains very murky. It's one of those issues that I gotta say is gonna be murky forever and ever, or not forever, but for a while, because I just don't see how this is ever gonna be 125% rock ribbed. If you do this, you qualify. If you don't, you don't. But here's some guidance you can use for when it's a post-secondary outcome. Okay, more on post-secondary. Sometimes it's easier to measure it by what's not allowed than what is. So here's your don't slide, where the reason why we make a, such a big stink and fuss about this is in the early days, a lot of agencies and consortia were marking what we would consider workforce preparation milestones, that is short-term milestones, and marking it as a full post-secondary outcome. So to be clear, if they're doing OSHA, safe serve or CPR or that sort of stuff, that might be a good outcome that might qualify for a workforce prep milestone, but definitely is not a post-secondary credential. So that's why we say that if you're having trouble figuring out whether it's the uh, you know literacy gain or whether it's the full post-secondary outcome, you can use this laundry list on this slide as a good rule of thumb as to when to mark one or the other. Okay, I'm moving to the next section because I feel like I, uh, you know, I'm kind of that way myself here on what the last five minutes of what I just said. So because I'm feeling that way myself, I feel compelled to give you another sanity check. Is everybody uh, still with me? And I guess I should also ask, am I all stat? Am I still clear or am I staticky? Did my PowerPoint go against, go off the rails against my will? And you're seeing my, my, uh, you know, you're seeing my email program now instead of my PowerPoint. You know, any of those crazy things happen without me uh, even realizing. Okay, that's your story, and you're sticking to it. So transition, that's another one of the six categories. So these are the six ways in which a student can earn that outcome. Transition to ASE transition to CTE, transition to college. So again, over to the right, that's showing what you need to mark. So that first one, you don't mark anything. That's all under the hood. It will basically be something we report to the legislature and shows up on watch board and all that. So again, you don't know, need to do anything. But again, for the record, that is an official CAPE outcome. And then the transition to either college or to CTE, there's, you know, a few bubbles that you can mark for those areas that you are marking. Uh, you know, here's what we've been using in more recent years that we kind of feel like uh, has worked better to help people understand this a little bit better is this graphic. So again, if you have a student achieve a transition outcome, their starting point is going to be one of these uh, blue squares over to the left. That is, they're starting in either K-12 adult ed or in non-credit community college adult ed. And then their end point is gonna be one of those red boxes over to the right, where they're going to get to CTE. They're either gonna transition to community college CTE or to K-12 adult ed CTE. If they transition to college, it's going to be into the four credit community college. Again, I'll note, we always go out of our way to say for credit in that red box to the right. If they transition from K-12 adult ed to non-credit community college, that's fine and dandy, but we would really consider that more of a lateral transition, not really a promotion. So we don't consider it a transition to college unless their end point is in for credit college, the end point shouldn't be non-credit. Okay, and then the final two areas are employment and wages. I've got to say this has been the area where we've had the fewest number of questions because it's literally, you're just bubbling, uh, you know, get a, you're, get, you're bubbling, uh, you know, has a job, get a job, keep a job or enter military for enter employment. You're bubbling increased wages or gets a better job for increased wages. It's super simple. So people haven't been asking this, but this, for the record, that's what you mark. I'll just mark that's also the area 
where we've been looking at data maps. We talked about that a lot in the earlier days, but again, we're still doing the data match with the chancellor's office and the data match with EDD. If you're able to use SSN, it's really a lot more important on the WIOA 2 side than it is for the CAPE side. But again, all these different ways are ways in which we get more employment outcomes from a statewide point of view in, uh, in both employment and wages. And I'll just say, you know, I, I do believe uh, without knowing what I'm talking about, that this uh, issue with data match, self-report through TE and self-report through survey, as we progress here in the next couple months, I do think this is gonna start becoming a bigger and bigger issue this year. There really isn't anything to talk about right now, but just know as you heard it here first, that this slide is probably something we're gonna be covering more here later as the year progresses. And then here, I'm just putting this here, I guess, really just in the, as an excuse to use this graphic. This is the one that we always got a few laughs at when we trained three or four years ago, but we're talking about how we're using data match. We're using self-reported data and TE. It all goes through that big funnel into data output. Hopefully, once we get all of those different things all put together, if you look at only one thing, it doesn't seem like much, but once you put it all together, it starts to paint a picture and starts to look about, you know, okay, yeah, it's five o'clock somewhere. Okay, a little bit more on services. So again, you're obviously recording it. In TE, we've got the three categories, supportive training and transition services. So supportive services are the ones I like to say are focused on, an indi on individual needs rather than instructional or training needs. That is, they help an individual better participate in their adult ed activities. So it's addressing things like child care, transportation, personal needs, you know, like, uh, you know, like uh, budgeting or mental health or whatever. Uh, so all those things that focus on the individual needs rather than the instructional needs are those services under supportive services. Training services, obviously more, in fo more focused on training and instruction, things that help students get jobs, things that focus on economic priorities in your local region, might give them more skills so they can get better jobs and so on. Those are generally what we're talking about when we say training services. And then transition services, I would say really a heck of a lot like training services, but they, they are more specific in there, really helping that student specifically transition to the workforce, specifically transition to workforce training and or specifically transition to college. So here's that COVID-19 update. Uh, I gave a little bit of that. I'm gonna get into that more next week, I think. But here, without getting into details, a lot of you I know, to some extent, have been providing a lot more services because of COVID-19. Others of you have, or maybe the same population of you, have also been looking at ways to better record services, know, knowing that it's been a lot harder to record outcomes for students in COVID-19, tougher to test, fewer students getting jobs, et cetera, et cetera. So these are just some suggestions on services that we know a lot of people are doing in the era of COVID-19. If you're doing it, obviously really good idea to show that you and the student are doing all those wonderful things. Uh, you know, so this first slide is just talking about what you're actually doing in layman's terms. The second slide is the exact same slide, but giving you bullets more directly related to the bubbles or check boxes that you use in TE. Okay, and then here's just a way to look at short-term services and that's using that same graphic we've been using for outcomes, that is three different categories of services with some examples for each of those three categories. Okay, looking a little bit at the CAPE summary, we're gonna stick very basic with reports. We'll get a little deeper next week when we do the advanced accountability, but we will at least show these reports. Can't really do anything re when, if you don't at least show the CAPE summary. We'll get into gory details next week, but for now we'll just stick 
to that basic explanation of the CAPE summary. We've got those three sections of the report represented by those three columns that I think stand out because they're the three columns using that purple shading. So again, we've got the literacy gains using pre and post to the left. We have those other CAPE outcomes with the six columns representing the six areas of AB 104 in the middle. And then we have those different areas of short-term services over there to the right. So we put them in three different sections because there are three different bars that you need to get over in order to qualify for reporting. So I've been saying low bar to the right, middle bar in the middle, high bar to the left, meaning there's a really low bar to get into that short-term services section. To the right, all you really need is uh, an, a unique student ID and a recorded service. If you have that, that's all that's necessary to get into that right-hand section. So you might say that's that really wide net that we cast at first, where we're really looking to just uh, throw that wide net out there and collect every single student that might conceivably have something to do with CAPE reporting in any way, shape, or form. So we cast that wide net and collect them in that right-hand section. Then in that middle section for CAPE outcomes, we have a little bit higher bar. That's where we're imposing some of those you know, requirements, you know, like demo missing demographics, 12 hours of instruction, and so on. And then the left-hand section is where we're recording the pre- and post-test results. The, uh, the uh, requirements to get in that left-hand section are mostly the same as the requirements to get in that middle outcome section. But the difference, of course, is the left-hand section relates to pre- and post-testing. So, of course, it requires pre- and post-testing. You know, that's the big difference between left and middle. Okay, and then another big one to bring in is that CAPE data integrity. So that, of course, is the one that you're submitting every quarter. It has all of the big data elements related to CAPE reporting. I'm not going to get into all these areas, but just to reiterate what I just said, I always like to talk about the top section the most. I continue to think that if you understand this top section called summary information, it's real easy to figure out the DIR. But if you don't really understand what's going on at the top, it's really difficult for those item counts and percentages to be anything other than authentic frontier gibberish. So that said, again, we're casting that really wide net by starting in the services section. We're looking at every single student that could conceivably relate to CAPE reporting somehow. We've got that big number. And then we're looking at those that do not have any kind of enrollment. So in this case, it's a little unrealistic. We've got 1,300 overall and only four are not enrolled. We're obviously uh, too, too clean for our own good with those numbers, but we'll move on anyway. We've got those four that don't have any program enrollment. So what's happening is before we start calculating, TE is going to kind of stop and smell the coffee, look at those four students that don't have enrollment, see if maybe they might have some good low-hanging fruit that we really want to get. Maybe some of them may got jobs, maybe some of them got pay raises, made a transition or whatever. So it's just bringing to our attention some that we may not want to let go. Uh, assuming it's all zeros, we let them go. It pairs it down a little bit. And then we have the number eligible for the DIR after we weed out those concurrents and those without enrollments and so on. So that seems like a bunch of gobbledygook, but the reason why I explain that is we get that bottom line number of students eligible for the CAPE DIR. That's a very important number to understand the report at all, because that 1309 in this example serves as the denominator for all 27 items on the DIR, again, that percentage you get to the right is going to be the item count number divided by that 1309 we get in that top section. So the numerator changes depending on the item we're reviewing, but that denominator stays the same no matter. In this case, it stays as that 1309. That is the number eligible. It's a lot, it sounds like a lot of gobbledygook, but I'll just emphasize that number is critical 
for the DIR to have any meaning in your data review process, period. Okay, and then this one I'm sort of throwing out of left field because it's new. Uh, you know, probably get a little bit more into this next week, but we've got some new, what we're calling I3 reports. Again, it has, you know, it doesn't relate that much to those other reports at all, but this is the one that's new in TE this year, so I'm mentioning it. So we're talking about AB 2098 or immigrant integration. Again, I3, just so you know, Immigrant Immigration Indicators I3, that's what it means. That's, we kind of made it up. But in any case, uh, what it does is it relates EL Civics co-ops to those eight areas of immigrant immigration. So it seems like a distant memory now, but a couple years ago, we were talking a lot about immigrant immigration. AB 2098 basically required at the state level for us to come up with something related to immigrant immigration. So one of the big findings that that committee came up with is that we've been doing this all along. It's called the L Civics. So in turn, we basically uh, related to those EL Civics co-ops to those immigrant immigration areas as outlined by that committee. So what we've done now is you can see the example here, so COAP 11 is one that fits under community participation, COAP 46 fits under health and well being, and so on. So, when a student attempts or passes that COAP, it will relate to that immigrant integration area. And at the agency, class, and individual level, you can now run reports in TE that will use that COAP pass fail information to identify areas of strength and areas of weakness related to these co-ops and immigrant immigration. And I'll just say, no, it's not the US citizenship test. It's those co-ops that we use for EL civic, civic participation. Now I will say that citizenship is a co-op category. And there are a lot of, there is like a, uh, I think it's actually that civic, and community participation. I'm, I'm uh, drawing a blank now on the terminology, but I'll just say, even though it's the wrong EL Civics focus area, there are a lot of those co-ops that relate to citizenship and relate to some of those citizenship related activities like uh, jury duty and, you know, like some of those uh, basic areas. You know, yeah, there are it's not sit prep, it avoids the sit prep focus area, but a lot of those co-apps nonetheless do cover, you know, I guess the best way to look at it is what I'll call CASAS competency area five. That is that competency area that covers all of those civic duty related issues that are also the sort of things they ask about in the US citizenship test. Sorry, I couldn't remember any of those terms, so that was an awkward explanation. So hopefully there's an answer in there some. Okay, so moving on to TE side, I'm breezing through the rest of us, that, but here's that infamous bubble boy slide. Uh, for basics level, I really think it resonates a lot. Again, this was what we talked a lot about. We're kind of dusting it off a little bit, but what we, is when we started all these outcomes, a big question is, okay, we understand the outcomes, that's fine but it's like totally confusing when we're at the deck plate level, actually recording outcomes for students. So we came up with this bubble boy slide. We color coded it according to those six areas of AB 104. So just for an easy example, you can see from the bottom of the slide that anything marked in blue relates to employment. If you look in the upper left, just for an easy example, got a job is marked in blue. Predictably enough, that's one of those outcomes that's an employment-related outcome. So those three you see in blue are the three that directly relate to employment outcomes when we're talking about CAPE outcomes and so on. Okay, here's the same information in another way. It's just using a TE screenshot instead of the uh, update record. It's giving you a letter coding instead of color coding. But again, the same thing, six different letters for six different areas of AB 104. Okay, so we're in the home stretch. Just some, some uh, resources here for you. 
So beginning of year letter, uh, this was the big thing that Neil wanted me to impress, that uh, the BOI letter is out. So it's not coming soon. It's already out for Cape. It should be there and posted on the TAP website. Like I said, there were some big updates to the Cape Data Dictionary this year. Get it presented as more of a backhanded slap than a reason to throw a parade because it's really the things that you've been asking us to do for a while and we haven't done. But now that we're in quarantine, we were able to do a lot of those things. So we have a, an, the enhancements. But it based, what it basically does from the Cape point of view is it basically looks at all those outcomes and it spells out in the dictionary what area of AB 104 or what bubble boy area it relates to, et cetera. So it spells it out a little bit more in the dictionary what relates to what. What I'll also say is it's more on the WIOA 2 side, but by proxy for most of these definitions, WIOA 2 and CAPE are exactly the same. So uh, what I'll point out is there's also a summary of changes where that's another one of those frequent, frequent requests where you just want to see, you don't want to read the whole stinking dictionary. You just want to find out those few areas where the new year is different from the old year. So we did that also. So you might say a little bit more to advertise here than most years. Again, not throwing any parades. We're just giving ourselves a backhand slap with the idea that maybe that'll get a few more of you to take a look at. Okay, here's the data submission calendar. Here's a super duper basic level issue. Uh, I'll reiterate, because again, people are saying you need the basics. I know some of you don't, but we'll pretend like you're all basic users and say the first date of any quarter is always July 1. When we started these trainings for non weoa types, it was really hard for some to get their arms around the fact that the quarter were not doing it three months, three months, three months, three months. It's always to date. So the first quarter is July 1 to September 30th. The second quarter is July 1 to December 31st. The third quarter is July 1 to March 31st. The fourth quarter is obviously the entire year with every quarterly report. Our, our date range gets a little larger with each subsequent quarter. And so hopefully everybody understands that if we did our second quarter and had it start on October 1 instead of July 1, for example, obviously we'd have all sorts of missing hours in pre-tests without post-tests and that sort of stuff. So necessarily every quarter starts on July 1. Again, I make a fuss because that was a big question. Okay, another thing about data submission is we've been talking this up a lot in network meetings is that quarterly data submission wizard. So the short answer is we're using this for both WIOA 2 and CAPE reporting. Uh, the short answer also, the good news is you only need to run it once. If you run it once and you run it correctly, you'll take care of WIOA 2 submission and CAPE submission in one fell swoop. So again, we're, the issue is the data part of this has been automated for a while but the DIR part of the submission has it. It's been noted many times the nuisance with needing to send that special PDF of the DIR. So now you can use that quarterly data submission that will cover your WIOA 2 data, your WIOA 2 data DIR, your CAPE data and the CAPE DIR by using that one wizard. You will no longer need to do the PDF separately in Holly and Veronica. You know, we're doing that data submission guidelines on October 14th. We'll go through the wizard in detail in that training. Okay, a little bit on assessments. The assessments for CAPE, exactly the same as the assessments for WIOA 2. Sorry, excuse me. The key thing there is the assessments this year, exactly the same as what they were last year. The quite frankly is if this ended up as a normal year, there was a lot going on in the federal system with things expiring in February 2021, because obviously it's anything but a normal year. The feds have always, already gone out of their way to say all those things that were scheduled to expire in February of 2021 are, out, all, are all obviously not expiring now. 
they pretty much extended everything to February of 2023 for the moment. So for now, what that means is the authorized tests for 2021, 100% the same as the authorized tests for 1920, which means reading and math goals for ABE, ASE learners, life and work reading, life and work listening for ESL. Here's the same thing that I just explained. If you're using multiple modalities, don't think this will be a big issue this year, but if you do, it's got to be from the same uh, modality. Uh, remote testing goes without saying there, you know, that's kind of, you know, another hour and a half we don't have, but obviously I'd be remiss if I didn't, re uh, you know, reference that process remote testing page, lots of instructional videos, lots of good documentation on how to do remote testing for pre and post for citizenship interview for el civics co-apps uh that california remote testing agreement is also on that web page the cde memo to the feds is also on that web page everything you wanted to know about remote testing and more is on that web page okay and then another part of that web page also is that reading level indicator or RLI, we've been talking that up a lot because uh, it's a lot easier to use, we think, than uh, doing remote testing. So that's the good news. I didn't really, I should have uh, spelled out the bullet a little bit better, sorry about that. But the two big bullets that are not on here but are probably the most important points for most is it does not require a proctor. That's one big selling point and the student can complete the ROI on their cell phone. That's the second big selling point for those. So for those two very big reasons, uh, you know, we think this will be a lot easier for a lot of people to do than remote pre and post testing. So that's the upside. The downside is uh, it's not an official pre-test or post-test. It's just an estimated level. I talked about that Octane Memo 20-5, where you still need the pre and post, but you can use informal assessment if all you're worried about is getting the student in the level. That's the issue. That's what you can get with the RLI, not a free or post, but a good way to get the student in the correct level, correct program, co correct class. And again, the RLI is administered a lot like that. We owe it to employment and earning survey. That is, you can administer it to students via email, via text, or both. So you go into TE, select the students that you want to administer to, and then again, you just select whether you want to do email, text, or both, send the test invitations. The student will receive it via her or his cell phone. They complete the RLI on their cell phone. When they click that final click, it will automatically send the result directly back to TE, and you can just view those results in the TE test cluster. These next slides, I'm gonna get into more detail next week, but we talked a lot in June and July about ways to try to record outcomes using things like collapse. That will be a little more formalized this year. So we're still saying, yeah, using those collapse is a really good idea. That can count as a new gain this year. So we'll talk more about this. Sorry, I got that, whoops, I went up wrong direction. So I taught, uh, talked a lot about that in June and July that still holds true. We'll repurpose it a little bit next week and uh, uh, relate them to those I3 outcomes. But again, some of that general issue where you're working with your distance learning classes, again, we'll get into more detail next week. But a lot of you are recording hours for learner mastery. A lot of you have students completing exercises using educational software. A lot of you have established uh, different things locally to record uh, gains and record outcomes for students and distance learning. So again, if you're doing that and working to show those DL students are making gains somehow, you uh, lots of good, you know, lots of uh, opportunity to market in your data. Obviously, everybody agrees. We want to be able to show that even though they're in distance learning, that they're still making gains. You know, here's that part with the L civics transitions, co-enrollment, and so on. Uh, okay, CASAS website, lots of great stuff there. My guess is a lot of you have been there before. Uh, here's that TAP, technical assistance request. 
I'll just say uh, this will be another one that you haven't heard a lot about in the last year, but I really do believe this is another one that you'll be hearing a lot more about here for the rest of the year. But if you feel like you need it, there's that special uh, request. And that's it. I'll just reiterate what Holly and Veronica put in the chat. There's an advanced level session next Tuesday at 1. Again, we'll get into a little gorier detail with those outcomes. We'll get into gorier detail with COVID-19. We'll get into gorier detail with the TE reports. So obviously, uh, you can go deeper with all this. We'll do all that and more here a week from now. So if you're feeling like this is all just silly stuff you know already, then come on in next week at 1 p.m. and hopefully that will be. So I'll turn it over to Veronica. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. And thank you to everyone who um, participated in today's webinar. Um, and Jasmine has asked, will you be going over what is due for CEP next week? That's a question for you, Jay. What is due for CAPE or what is in the presentation? Sorry. Oh, what is due for CAPE? You uh -huh. mean the specific CAPE deliverables? Yes. Okay. Well, uh, I think in terms of data, I kind of gave what you need to do for data. Um, hmm. I'll take that for account. So I guess what you're talking about are some of those things in NOVA which I got to say I stay away from simply because that's not my department. So I, so sorry, I'm going to give you a non-answer on that one and uh, kind of take that question for counsel because uh, I don't really mind doing it. But that said, I'm not sure if uh, my uh, license uh, allows me to go over those other things. I need to kind of check in with folks before giving you an answer there. So. I've got a wonderful license, but I'm not sure if it has that particular bullet point on my license. So I'm going right. to check okay. that because I don't talk about Nova stuff. I'm the data guy, not the fiscal guy. Go ahead, Veronica. I'm right. Sorry. So Jasmine, I was going to ask a follow-up question. Are you talking about, oh, she's talking about uh, CAP data and accountability. So the- Right, that's the data. DIR and the DIR and the data. That's it for Kate. There's not- there's not a lot of those other data deliverables for CAPE like there is for WEAL. So I guess to that question, uh, you know, there really aren't a lot of other things other than you, you do need to complete that data submission wizard every quarter. There's no PD plan or tech plan or EL civics plan or any of that crazy stuff like there is for WEAL. Okay, great. Yeah, it looks like you answered her question. Thank you, Jay. And yes, thank you all very much for participating in today's webinar. I have posted several links in the chat. So if you want to go ahead and download the chat, feel free to do so, so that you'll have access to all of those links at a later time. I posted a link to next week's webinar. So as Jay mentioned, he'll be taking a deeper dive um, on CAP accountability. So if you haven't registered for that, definitely feel free to do so. Um, I also posted the webpage of where today's recording as well as the PowerPoint presentation will be uploaded tomorrow. So be sure to check that out and also share with colleagues who were unable to um, participate in today's webinar. And lastly, I posted the link to the CAP Summit registration. Registration is open and continues to be open. Spaces are filling up fast this year. It is free. And if you like what you heard today and you want to learn more, especially from the CASAS team, they will have several presentations and they are also teaming up with local agencies so that you'll be able to see some of these practices implemented at the local level. So if you haven't registered, please be sure to register and then also share with colleagues and encourage them to register as well. We have four days worth of wonderful sessions, so we want to make sure that all have an opportunity to participate. So thank you again, Jay, and thank you to everyone who participated in today's webinar, and thank you to Holly, the rest of the CAP TAP team, and we will see you all next week for part two, the deeper dive of CAP accountability. Everyone have a great day. Thank you.